That's good. Good morning. Raise your hand if you're awake. All right. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you to the test in a minute. I'm tired too. So it's all, In fact, David, my voice is tired. You boost me just a tiny bit on the mic. I'm going to ask David to do something in just a minute. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to put up an image on the screen. It's going to have four or five words on it, okay? I need you to shout out the first word that you notice, okay? Because there's several, all right? This is going to be interesting. This is going to reveal something. I'm not trying to, like, psychoanalyze us or nothing, okay? This is just a, a, an experiment, shall we say. All right, are you ready? Not if you're with me? Good, good. All right, yell out the first word you see. Three, two, one. Okay, that's what I expected, <laughs> right? It was a little bit of everything. How many saw the word truth first? Wow. Okay, all right. How many saw the word love first? Looky there. How many saw the word the? Anybody? Yes, thank you. I knew there, there's always one or in or any of that, right? Did you see John? Did you? Yes, okay. Did you see, anybody see John first beside Doug? Really? Okay, I did not expect that. Okay. Today, that's what we're talking about. What does it mean to speak the truth in love? And Lord willing, maybe next week we might talk about how to speak the truth in love in a culture that's kind of shifting its values right now. What do you do when someone comes to you with a question that you're just like, well, I don't want to answer that? How do you respond? How do you speak the truth in love? Now, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to show you another pair of superheroes. And as soon as you recognize them, shout out who they are. Okay, you ready? Here we go. Who are these two people right here? Wonder Woman and Aquaman. Everybody know that? Those are the new ones. These are the, the really ugly versions of the new ones, right? That, that everybody loves the new guys. Now, here's the deal. In the new movie Justice League, came out a couple years ago, there's this great scene. Wonder Woman has a particular device. I would call it a weapon, but it's not really a weapon. See if anyone can tell me what it is in this next one. Anybody know? The Lasso of Truth. Oh, now we're talking. Now you see where this is going. There's a scene where Aquaman, big, burly, strong Aquaman, is talking to the rest of the Justice League. You got Batman, you got Cyborg, you got uh, Flash, the fast guy, and a couple other people, I think. And they're sitting around, and they're about to go battle the big bad guy. I think his name's Steppenwolf in this huge, giant guy. And uh, seriously, I think that's his name. And not the band, the, 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 the guy. And they're talking about it, and it really doesn't look good, and they're scared, and they're nervous. And so... Aquaman sits down, and all of a sudden, he just starts saying, I don't want to fight this guy. I don't want to fight this guy at all. We're going to die. <laughs> I don't want to fight him. I'm too young to die. We don't want to die. And then he starts looking around the room at the superheroes, and he starts, like, telling them their deficiencies. Like, you're just fast, and I don't know, Batman, I don't know about you. You have no powers. You're just, you're just rich. And, you know, and he goes around the room, and then he gets to Wonder Woman. He goes, and you, whoo, <laughs> you're just gorgeous, <laughs> right? And he, he has this, this moment, and he's just like, and everybody's just kind of like, what is he doing? And then Batman goes, <clears throat> look, and he looks, and he's sitting on the lasso of truth. And it is compelling him to share the truth. And he's just like, blah, 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 blah. He can't stop. He sits there, he throws it back at her. And he's so embarrassed because he spoke. He didn't speak the truth in love. He spoke his love with a lot of truth. Today, we're going to address a story. Last week, we talked about one of my favorite love stories, the story of Gomer, the wife, being loved repeatedly by his, by his faithful husband, Hosea. Today, we're going to take a different turn, look at another love story, also one of my all-time favorites, because it is a story of forgiveness. Ooh, an incredible grace. And it is this powerful demonstration, this example that Jesus shows of speaking truth and love. And it is so powerful. It is so straightforward. For the first time in many, many moons, I'm not even going to introduce it. I'm not going to set it up. It needs no introduction. We are diving straight in because Jesus just lays it down, and it is beautiful, and it is powerful. So open your Bibles to John chapter 8 if you haven't already. If you're following along at home or you're reading it on a digital app, I'm going to read from the NLT translation today if that helps you sync up. The NLT, John chapter 8, let's read the first 11 verses together. And it begins like this. Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered, and he sat down and taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. 
The law of Moses commands that we stone her. What do you say? <laughs> now right there, pause. I don't know about you, but I smell a trap. Anybody else smell a trap? Let's read on. They were trying to trap him. <laughs> there it is. They were trying to trap him into something, saying something that they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down. Oh, this drove them nuts. He didn't answer. He, he stooped down. He rode in the dust with his finger. And they kept demanding an answer. Answer us. So he stood up again. He said, all right, all right. Tell you what. Let the one who has never sinned throw that first stone. And then he stooped back down and he kept writing in the dust. When his accusers heard this, oh, <laughs> they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and he said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. Now, a lot of people stop right there. A lot of people want to stop there. And frankly, I can understand why. Because that ties it up with a nice little bow. There's no commitment needed. It's all grace. It's all love. It's all forgiveness. And it's beautiful, like, a, like a, an episode of 90210, a 30-minute little episode that just gets wrapped up. We've got the tension and the arc and the resolution, and everybody can go. It's wrapped up with a bow, and you're so happy. 22 minutes of programming and 8 minutes of commercials, and all is right with the world. There's just one problem. Jesus didn't stop there. In fact, what he did is he went on. He would say five more very powerful words. Words, I might say, hear me, just as equally loaded with love and truth and grace, equally full of them. He goes on to say these five words. Go and sin no more. Your translation may say, go and leave your life of sin. Or even more to the point, go and stop your sinning. So today, we're going to explore what does it mean to speak the truth in love? And following the example of Jesus, I hope we can answer this big question for us today. Here's our question. If true love speaks, can we stay silent in a culture of confusion? Man, I hope we can answer that. Some of you may be able to answer it now. I read an article just this week by Lisa Bevere, an international speaker, great best-selling author, and she wrote this, and I quote, Walk into most churches nowadays, and you will likely hear a message of love, hope, and encouragement. Cool. I'm all for that. And she says, all that is well and good, especially after decades of overly harsh messages. The pendulum has naturally swung to the other side. But her question is, have we swung it too far the other way? Have we become so seeker-friendly that we now neglect what it means to be a true friend to anyone who walks through our doors. And she finishes with this. Now the mistake we all make, though, is not to shrink back from speaking the truth. It's to learn to speak the truth with love, like Jesus did. And Jesus was a true friend of sinners. And thank you, Lord, that, that, that he was, because that's me. And I'm thankful that he didn't come and just blow me out of the water with justice first. He reached to me with love, and we have to be the same way. So from time to time, I think it's a good idea to make sure we understand what it means to be a biblical, true friend, especially from a biblical view. Now, I don't know about you, but I want friends in my life who speak the truth to me. Anybody else? I want friends in my life who are willing to be honest. I need that. I want that. I have to have that. But I don't want them to beat me up with it. I don't want them to come to me and bash me over the head with it, but I do need them to tell me things that I need to hear. But please do it in a loving way. When Amy and I first met in our college years, oh, y'all, we could not be more different. She was way over here in the land of mercy and grace. And I was way over here in the land of justice and truth. I didn't think we would ever hit it off, like, at all. So here we are, and, like, I would watch her and observe her. This is, you know, we weren't even engaged yet. I'm just watching her, and she deals with friends, and she, she was so, so full of, of, of mercy and grace. If she ever needed to help a friend or correct someone or issue a gentle rebuke, it was one of those things, even if they were sliding into dangerous territory or sin, 
She was so incredibly soft and so loving. Her gentle rebuke would almost be like a, like a gentle kiss on a summer's morn. I wonder if you would even feel it. And if she had to use a rebuke, I imagine she would probably use something like this. Boop. <laughs> you might, you might want to think possibly maybe about going a different direction. Boop. Right? Full of, of mercy and love. I, on the other hand, if I had to pick something, I would use a sledgehammer. Big on truth, slightly lacking in love. Seriously, I, I didn't have time for it. I was so aware of truth that I would approach people and I would just be like, y'all, I don't have time for your little snowflake soft feelings, okay? You are wrong. Cut it out. Man up, bro. Put your purse down. Go park your Prius and get to the altar. It's time, okay? Seriously, don't, don't you come over and take your tree-hugging, latte-sipping, man-bun, fake-wearing thing to the altar and get saved now. Justice and truth demands it. Boom. And I had done my job. Or so I thought. And then God sent Amy to approach me, and in her beautiful, thankfully, she cared enough where she spoke the truth to me in love, and she boldly, yet gently, lovingly, simply told me the truth. She said, sweetie, I love you, and I love how you stand on God's word, and I love that you know it, and you are bold about that, but you don't have to wield his truth like a club. She was right. Might need a little bit more this. But you certainly don't have to use that. And that's what I love about Jesus. Everything points back to him. You don't have to wield it like a club. Every one of us have been on the receiving end of that, right? Every one of us have been on the receiving end of somebody wielding truth like a weapon. And be honest, it hurts. It is not pleasant. And that is because truth without love is mean. But love without truth is meaningless. It's a lie. If there's no truth, then that means it's meaningless. It's fake. It's lie. Y'all, we need both. We need truth and we need love. And when we look at Jesus, we see these two beautiful qualities meshed together on full display. And people need to see that in his church. They need to see that in the bride. When we look at Jesus, we see he is the God who so loved the world, he stretched his arms out on the cross and paid for it. All our sins. Yet if you look at it, he's the very embodiment of truth. He is both simultaneously wrapped up. In fact, a few chapters later, we just sang it. Jesus would declare, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one goes to the Father except by me. You know, that's incredibly narrow-minded. But it's true. And it's full of love. Because he was telling us, this is the way to the Father. Think about what we just read. The woman who's caught in the act of adultery. Ask yourself this, how did the religious people, the church of that day, if you will, how did they treat her? It says very specifically, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, okay? That's kind of like leaders of that day. They brought her out, and I was so proud of how they acted. Oh, they brought her out, and they knelt down beside her, and they said, sweet, dear little girl, let us cover you up. Let's stand you up. Let's restore your dignity, and let's speak words of encouragement. No, they didn't do that. It says they wanted to stone her. Think about it. We're not talking like pebbles. <laughs> I mean, stones meant to kill the person. That's what they want to do. That's what the spiritual leadership of that time wanted to do. Think about it. Here she is, guys, totally exposed in her sin, surrounded by people she should be able to count on, surrounded by people who are nothing now but self-righteous accusers wanting to stone her. But thankfully, Jesus was there. Jesus shows up kneels beside her, restores her dignity, forgives her sin, gives her hope again. And I love it. He, he defends her first, and he says, I'll tell you what, let anyone who's without sin throw the first stone at her. Go ahead. I'll wait. And 
I love what it says. There's a hidden gem here. It says one by one, they drop their stones and they walk away, beginning with who? The oldest. Maybe that's because they were at least mature enough to realize they'd lived enough to say, it ain't me that's without sin. I'm not throwing the first stone. You got me, Jesus. I needed that. And they walk away with the oldest. To finally, the youngest are standing around going, where is their buddy? Guess we're not doing, so we're not doing the stoning party then? Oh, okay, all right. And they walk away. It's crazy. It is so amazing. And he says, woman, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? And I could just see her cowering in fear, and she looks up, tears streaming down her face. She's probably shaken to the core, knowing she's moments away from death. I would be. She says, no, no one, Lord. And then he says these beautiful words, neither do I condemn you. And it is simply awe-inspiring. What an amazing display of mercy and grace and beauty all wrapped up in this powerful moment. The God of eternity wrote himself into the story, comes down into our mess, writes in the dust around us, transforming us with just a, a single touch of his presence. And it is beautiful and it is powerful. But if Jesus had the attitude of many of us today, that is where the story would end. But thankfully it doesn't because his love extends so much deeper than that, so much farther as beautiful as the words are, then neither do I condemn you. His next words are equally loving. They're equally full of grace and truth. He says, go now and leave your life of sin. Why? Because he wants the best for her. That's how much he loves her. He wants the best for her. And he knows she is settling for something that is not God's ideal. That is not God's standard. And he's not afraid to say that. But notice how loving he is when he does it. It's truth and it's love. He knows she's been drinking from a dry, cracked well that's not going to quench her thirst. He knows she doesn't have a husband. She's got 70. Eight, who knows? He knows all about her. Now it's time to re restore her and say, I have something better for you. You are living so far below what I have for you. You have sold yourself short. And so many people have taken advantage of you, but I want to tell you something. I love you, and I have so much better things in store. Do you see what's happening here? Her encounter is an invitation to more. And it is breathtakingly beautiful. And that's one of the things I love about Jesus. Jesus loves us where we are, but he never leaves us where we are. Thank you, Lord. He loves us enough to not leave us in our sin. Because when we're in sin... Be honest. It may be fun for a season, but you're miserable. Anytime I'm not walking hand in hand with the Lord, I'm miserable. Because I'm, I'm selling myself short. I'm not fulfilling my purpose. I feel like there's a cloud hanging over my head. You know what I'm, don't you look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. We're all in this together. You been there? This is a thank you one honest person. God bless America. <laughs> Jesus doesn't leave us there. He loves us and he pulls us out. So here's my question, y'all, and get ready. I, I, I should have issued a disclaimer and a warning. Another roller coaster ride. Going to get deep quick. My question as the modern day church, do we do the same thing that he does? Do we do that? Did you see what he said? Jesus loves us where we are, but he doesn't leave us there. Are we doing the same thing or are we too scared to preach the truth? Are we too scared to share it? My question is, let me ask an even more honest question. Do we even know God's word enough to recognize truth anymore? Boom. Because there's a lot of churches that I look around and I'm thinking, how do you justify that? That is blatant heresy, if not outright blasphemy. But so many Christians are silent, and shame on us, so many pastors are silent. Because they take the easy way and the safe way, and they say, oh, I don't want to upset people. Well, yeah, nobody should want to upset people. Like some kind of masochist? But we should be willing to speak the truth in love and say, listen, I, I understand where you're coming from. I love you. Let's see what God's word says. Because you know what? My opinion doesn't mean squat. I want to know what God's opinion on this. Can we, have we gotten to the place with so much moral relativism and so much anything goes in our society that we can no longer, everything's just a sliding scale of gray? can't even tell absolutes anymore? Do we even differentiate between good and evil? Because there's time, coming a time where it says, 
Woe to those who call good evil and then call evil good. And they applaud it. Oh, God, help us. And I look at this, just a few chapters over in the Gospel of John, look what Jesus says now. He says, if you hold to my teaching, then you are really my disciples. If you do that, then you'll know the truth. And guess what? The truth will set you free. Did you catch that? Read it again. Notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say, if you water down my teaching, oh, then you're my disciples. Can I go deeper? Can I go deeper? Notice it doesn't say, if you redefine my teaching, then you're my disciples. Notice it doesn't say, if you can improve on my teaching. Oh, wise generation of 2019. He doesn't say that. He says, if you hold. You know what that means? Bear hug. If you grasp, if you cling to it, if you do that, then we will not only know the truth, we will be really acting as his disciples. When we wonder what's right and wrong, we're supposed to turn to God's word. Not take a poll. So many people, oh, I don't want to hurt their feelings. Well, I don't want to hurt their feelings either. But lying to me is not being my friend. Hiding the truth from me is not being my friend. If I'm stepping over into a danger zone, please have the courage and the love to tell me that. Please. And I hope you would ask the same. Remember, we have two, two diametrically opposed philosophies going. We have Jesus, who is the truth teller. And then we have a world corrupted by Satan, who is the deceiver. He is the liar. He is, that's what he does. He loves to blur the lines. He loves to erase boundaries that God has set up. Make no mistake, just look around. Read the headlines. He loves to deny and revise and, and redefine things and always rearranging the price tags on sin and what it will really cost you. He is a master at that. He is the deceiver. In fact, Jesus calls him the father of lies. And he would go on to say this. We have a verse here for you. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him when he lies he is speaking his native tongue. I picture like a snake tongue flickering. <laughs> that old serpent. You know what I mean? He lies. That's all he does. That's what he does. What about you? Can you recognize the truth? Can you? When you see the news, when you hear it in the school, can you say, that's not, that's not true at all. Let me, let me speak up. Can you recognize when the enemy is trying to erase God's protective bar barriers and, and boundaries? Look at this comic. I love this. This is so perfect. His commandments are guardrails designed to protect us. It's not a fence to constrict us. It's for our good. We don't hear that anymore. This is such simple biblical 101. His commandments are for our best. He established an order and a design and I need to ask, church, can we tell when Satan is coming along and trying to blur the lines, lines that God has clearly established in his word? Because it's happening every day, and it's happening everywhere. Sometimes it will jump out at you, and it should shock you. Other times, it's a little more insidious. It's a little more subtle. So let's bring it home. How does that apply to us today? What do you take out of here? What is it? I want to share with you an article I read just this week by a guy named Dale Hudson. Dale Hudson's a good man. He's a godly man. He's been serving in the church for almost three decades, specifically in children's ministry for 28 years, pouring himself into the lives of the next generation. And he writes this. There is an interesting new buzzword among younger parents. I'm hearing the term baby. Not baby, baby, T-H-E-Y-B-Y. This refers to a baby that is born and raised free from the biblical constraints of stifling gender designation. He goes on to say this, and I say this in all love, I'm not making fun of this at all. I want you to hear this article. Parents who adopt this child-rearing strategy intentionally will keep the baby's gender and their God-given anatomy a secret from everyone else. Not for a week, not for a gender reveal party, not for months, for years. And they ask everyone to refer to the child only with plural vague pronouns. The goal is to create a childhood totally devoid of gender. And then he goes, I'm already seeing the effects of this in my middle schoolers. 
Some, even in my high schoolers who have adopted this, who are now identifying as neither male nor female, instead choosing to call themselves non-binary. Some of the kids literally will choose to jump back and forth between the two. One day, one of my students, a male youth, dresses as a boy, demanding and asking to be called by a male name and referred to as him, just days later showing up dressed as a girl, demanding that we call her now her, as he now follows my daughter into the ladies' locker room at the school. So I did what every good researcher does, find out. I Googled it. <laughs> and I said, what, what is going on here? An article after article came up, and it said, and you can do this at home later, don't do it now. Now, there are no longer two genders. There are up to 27 genders for you to choose from today. 27 genders. Another article said, that's not true, there's 36. And they list them. And I look at this, and I say this with all the love in the world. That's not what God's Word says. It's not. God's Word says this. He says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. You know what that tells me? That tells me we are his image bearers. We have the honor the duty to carry ourselves forward according to his plan, not mine. I don't get to redefine this. He made us. We are created in his image, created specifically male and female, perfect compliments, exquisitely created by a loving creator, knit together in the womb, intricately designed to come together to ensure the procreation of the human race. Up until a few years ago, this didn't even need to be said. This was common, understood, biblical, and scientific and biological fact. Nobody tried to erase this, but as our culture continues to slide further and further away from God's plan for humanity, this is what we will reap. And as we continue to stay silent, if we don't speak up and say, this is not what God's best plan is, this is not true. If we don't speak the truth in love, when we don't, I promise, we are not loving our children. We are doing them a disservice. And somebody has to speak obvious truth and say, enough. That is, you are settling for something that is not God's best. This is, children are growing up confused about what should not be confusing. It's true. You know what? That's on us. This is where the love comes in. We are not loving people if we say nothing. We are not, if we hold the truth and we don't let people know it, are you willing to hold up the standard of truth? Are you willing? Or are you taking the easy road and being silent? Because as the drivers of this kind of agenda continue to impose gender blurring on society, we who believe simple, obvious truths like that, we have to be prepared to share this. We have to be prepared to equip our children to know the truth, not only to know the truth, but to believe who they are in Christ, to find their identity, not in the latest pop culture trend. I'm this, I'm that. No, no, God says you're this, you're special, you're awesome, and you have the identity of Christ if you know him. And that is beautiful, and it's awesome, because these constantly changing values are shifting sand. And man, we're going to lose the next generation if we don't show there's a foundation, a better way, God's way. Now, I want to give you a warning. As you speak the truth in love, please be prepared, but hear that word. Speak the truth in love. Don't be like old Matt. I am so glad you didn't know me back then. I would bludgeon you with the truth. I might be right, but I was so wrong. Don't be like that. But don't expect the world to applaud if you speak the truth in love. They didn't applaud Jesus. Don't expect them to say, oh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you for that refreshing dose of truth. Because truth sometimes is convicting. It convicted me. It changed my whole life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that somebody thought enough of me to invite me to church to hear the gospel, and then to Ridgecrest, North Carolina, where I could finally say, what? <laughs> what is this, Jesus? Oh, this makes sense. And then I could come forward and I could accept him and say, y'all, we are not seeking the applause of man. We are seeking the favor of God. We're supposed to be his disciples. George Orwell nailed it years ago. His quote is still true today. 
The further a society drifts from truth, the more it will resent and hate those who speak it. Count on it. They hated Jesus, and they will. So here's what I want you to do. For people who may be championing the, the they-be mindset or whatever, and they may respond to you in anger, love them. People who may come to you and say, you are such a racist, sexist, bigoted, homophobe, Islamophobe, your mama-phobe, whatever-phobe, love them. You're not being narrow-minded. You're being biblical-minded. Those people who come and say, you are so outdated, I wish you Christians would just die and go away, love them. Don't judge them. In love, show them the truth. They don't care what you know if they don't know you care. You have got to demonstrate love. They, they come to you and say, oh, that's Old Testament stuff. That doesn't apply today. Show them in God's Word in the New Testament. Show them where Jesus always referred to things like male and female in terms of gender. There was no equivocation. He made a clear distinction between the two. God's design has never included 27 genders. It's never included 31 flavors. This is not Baskin-Robbins. This is simple, biblical truth. And now, church, hear me, more than ever, we have got to have men and women who will raise their sons like Braden Wisham, designed to reflect God's master plan. Not Satan's deception. Not the latest cultural whim. That's not what we're, that is not the best God has. When we deviate from his plan, you know this is true, the results are always negative. When we think we know better than God, we got this here. I know you created this. I know you made us. I know our parts fit together. I know all that. You know what? No. We know better. We got, we'll take it from here, God. What are we saying? What are we saying when we tell God we know better than you? We know better than your best plan, your design. This is what makes us special. Simple things. I'm just using this as an example. The difference between two genders shows that we are special and equal in our uniqueness. It's God's plan, his design for humankind, his idea, his best plan. He's the creator. We're the creation. He's the potter. We're the pot. He's the father. We are the children. And when God's created order is under attack and the enemy is trying to confuse you and blur the lines and spread confusion, we must speak the truth in love, even if doing so is unpopular or controversial. So I got to ask you, how are you doing with that? Because as the days grow darker, we are the ones who need to speak truth. We are the ones who need to demonstrate love. If we don't, don't be surprised if we see a generation surrounding us that is confused about things that should not be confusing. It's so clear. Are you willing to hold up the timeless biblical standard of the gospel? Are you willing to do that? Or are you silent? Remember, all evil needs to triumph is for good people to do nothing. That's all you have to do. You uncomfortable about it? Just, just take a seat. Don't worry about it. We got this. And the devil marches millions more to something less than God's best. And that's true love, saying, man, I hear where you're at, but there is something better. There is something. And if I'm honest, guys, I look around at the modern church, the body of Christ at large. We as Christians are eerily silent on so many issues that are wreaking havoc on people's lives. Sins we all deal with. Name them. Greed. Lust. <laughs> Envy, take your pick, slander, gossip, moral relativism, gender confusion, redefining God's clear definition of gender, redefining God's clear definition of marriage, infanticide, abortion, pornography, flooding the streets like a sewer. And too many of us say nothing. Y'all, if they don't hear truth here, tell me where they will. Tell me where they will, because they're not hearing it in school. They're sure not hearing it on TV. They're not getting it in the movies, unless you're seeing a Christian movie. You're it. <laughs> Tag. <laughs> you're it. I'm it. But you know what? We're enough, because we're God's church, and we are empowered by him. Listen, I've got to ask you a question. Are you staying quiet? because you think it's the loving thing to do? Are you staying quiet because you think it's compassionate? Is that what truly loving people equates to now? Silence? God, help us. 
Again, if I'm heading towards a cliff, would you please tell me? If I'm hammered out of my mind and I'm driving my family in my 1999 Kia minivan, please take the keys away. Please. Because I'm weak in that moment and I need somebody to speak truth and love to me. Would you do that? Would we rather risk leaving somebody in the bondage of sin just because we might temporarily cause them discomfort as the Holy Spirit convicts them? I think sometimes we do. Have we confused loving people unconditionally with giving a blanket approval of every action? Do we believe God's word still speaks to these things today? That's the question. Do we believe God's word still speaks today? Because I got to tell you guys, it's not God's word that's silent on these controversial issues today. It's us. God's word isn't silent. We are. And we can't be. You know why? Because we're the ambassadors for God. We're the ones. He gave us the keys and said, Jurors, go into all the world. Make disciples. Go show this love. Show that as your pastor, guys, I hope our church will never shy away from the truth in the name of love. I hope we will speak true love. You know why? Because that's what Jesus did. He never shied away from truth in the name of love. His love runs so much deeper than that. As your pastor, I will not be silent. I will speak the truth always, and I will always do my best to speak it drenched in love. You know why? Because I know my identity in Christ, and I know that I am just one sinner hoping to tell another sinner where I found forgiveness. Probably like you. You probably feel that way too. That's why you're here. That's why you're faithful. This is so, may we never be scared to present God's truth. His constant, unconditional, infinite love is for us. And I want you to remember this. Write this down. Love always calls us out of brokenness into something better. That's what he does. He calls us out of our sin into something better. The same Jesus who we just read a minute ago says, neither do I condemn you, followed it up by saying, now go and leave your life of sin. You know why? Because he doesn't just forgive sins and remove our sin and our shame and all of the stains. He sets us free from sin from its dominion in our life. He sets that free, and people need to hear that. People need to hear the truth. Loving God and loving people is more than a slogan. It's our identity. Serving God and serving people is more than just words on the wall. It's our identity. It's what we do. It's what we're supposed to be about. God, in his relentless love for you, didn't settle for anything less, and neither should we. So I'm going to leave you with this story, and then we're going to have a time of commitment. I just read, and maybe you saw this going around making the rounds, about an elderly man who was hurrying to make his 8 a.m. doctor's appointment. And he wanted so badly to finish quickly with his doctor because he had to race to get to another appointment. And the doctor said, this is not like you to be in a hurry. I guess you've never had this 8 a.m. thing, but can I ask where you are in such a hurry to go? And the old man proudly said, I have a 9 o'clock appointment with my wife. Every day at 9 a.m., I go to the hospital and I get to have breakfast with my wife. And the doctor said, do you mind if I ask her condition? Why is she in the hospital? And he says, she is battling Alzheimer's. And for the past five years, she doesn't really even know who I am. The doctor leaned forward, he's very puzzled. He says, why do you continue to do that if she has no idea who you are? The old man looked at him and said, because I still know who she is. all he knew her identity do you he knew what his purpose was do we church do we understand our identity and what we're doing we are the ambassadors of the gospel we are the ambassadors of the good news and when we hide it when we keep it to ourselves or we don't let it leave these walls we are not being good disciples and today i just wanted to share that message we are called to speak the truth and do it in love Let's pray about it. Would you bow with me? God, I thank you for the power of your word and the simplicity of it to cut through our walls and our stony hearts, to cut through our silence. Lord, forgive us individually or as a church for any time we might have shied away from issues that were affecting so many of your precious children. And we did it in the name of convenience or what we thought was loving. 
Lord, may we always be loving, but may we follow your example to not shy away from sharing truth when it needs to be shared. God, we pray for our nation. We pray for our leaders, local, national, state. We pray for our church. We pray for the next generation, beautiful babies like Braden. God, we pray that we would be the examples you want us to be. That we wouldn't be found guilty of hiding the truth or, or putting our light under a bushel, but we would be willing to stand because you did. You showed us that example. So God, call us back. Call us back to the truth. Call us back to love. Show us that beautiful balance, Jesus, that you have. May we be found faithful. We love you. We thank you for this time. In Jesus' name.